All right. Good evening. We're going to go ahead and get started. It's hard to believe week nine of uh, First and Second Peter is here, and uh, we're already at uh, First Peter chapter five. And so, if you want to turn there, uh, First Peter chapter five. Last week we saw from our study, uh, Gary led us that suffering comes, and God allows it. Uh, for one of those very basic reasons, to try, to test, to prove us, and, and, uh, and at least four things that Gary shared about persecution, how it, it measures how strong our faith is, how it proves our trust in God and teaches us to depend on Him more and more, and it proves and strengthens our practice and endurance, and it proves our faith, which attracts others to Christ. And now, Peter's going to turn our attention to encourage uh, the leaders. So, getting a little bit of feedback. Yeah, we'll, we'll see if we can't work that out. First Peter 5, then, if you'll turn with me. So now it's times of persecu- persecution. Um, demands that God's people have adequate spiritual leadership. And so Peter is turning then to the leaders in the church to encourage them. And uh, as, as it is common even in our culture and in our day when things are difficult and hard, we see that leadership also has a challenging time. And so Peter now is going to challenge the leaders Uh, Leaders can't run and turn in those times of difficulty, but rather true leaders provide encouragement and direction. And so we see Peter turning his attention to the leaders. So if you look at 1 Peter 5 with me, let's uh, read verses 1 through 14, the chapter together, and then uh, we'll walk our way through it. 1 Peter 5, to the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder and as a witness of Christ's sufferings, who also will share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be, not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. In the same way, you who are younger, submit yourselves to your elders. All of you, clothe yourself with humility toward one another because God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Verse 9. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. And with the help of Silas, whom I regard as a faithful brother, I've written to you briefly, encouraging you and testifying that is the true grace of God. Excuse me. Stand fast in it. She who is in Babylon, chosen together with you, sends you her greetings, and so does my son Mark. Greet one another with a kiss of love. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. Would you pray with me? Let's commit this time to the Lord. Father, thank you for the truth of your word. Thank you for all who have gathered here and those that will Uh, join us online and and to watch later. Father, thank you for the word that you preserved for us to study. Thank you for the encouragement that it will bring to us as we yield ourselves to your truth, as we humble ourselves to hear from you. We trust, God, that you would direct our thoughts, and may my words be a reflection of what you want us to learn and your truth, not my opinion. And so direct our time now. We'll give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. And so Peter begins now here in chapter 5 with his personal experience as he's calling to the elders. He says, I appeal to you as a a fellow elder, as a a witness of Christ's suffering. And so it brings us right back to his personal experience. It's almost like going back to, uh, to Gethsemane there and the suffering that Christ would face that Peter was, was able to, to see and be a part of. And the, and again, that experience with Christ on the Think about some of the experiences that Peter had, right, with Christ on the Mount of Transfiguration. You know, Matthew 17, verses 1 and one through 5, Peter, James, and John, where God affirms everything Jesus had done and that he was about to do. 
And we see Peter understands that. And so it's a personal experience that Peter is sharing about this suffering that Christ shares in. He says as a, a fellow elder, as a witness of that suffering, he had, he'd experienced it firsthand. And so it's encouraging as he's sharing these words because it's not just something he had heard about, but something he had actually gone through, suffering himself and encouraging the leadership, the fellow elders to follow Christ. And, and I appreciate what Warren Wearsby says about uh, those in the church and leadership. He says this, if the leaders of the church are not moving forward, the church will not move forward. If the leaders of the church aren't moving forward, then the church will not move forward. And so Peter's instructing then the elders or the pastors, uh, the shepherds of the flock of God to shepherd the flock. If you'll notice then uh, in verse 2, he says, be shepherds of the flock. Be shepherds of the flock. And I love the picture. We see this throughout Scripture, don't we, uh, of that sheep mentality. And, and I'm thankful it's sheep because at least sheep are like clean animals, right, when God says we're like sheep. Uh, unlike, you know, the unclean ones like pigs and all that, uh, that'd be unfortunate to be called that. But again, he's saying sheep, and so he's saying shepherd the flock of God. And so think with me a little bit about some of the imagery that's given in Scripture. Psalm 23, right? The Lord is the what? He's that good shepherd, right? In John 10, uh, he says, uh, my, my sheep know my voice, right? They, they hear that shepherd. And so sheep are notoriously ignorant and prone to wander away, if they, do, if they don't follow the shepherd. And don't you find that in your own heart and our own hearts, right? We're prone to wander, right? To go our own direction rather than to follow the good shepherd. And so the challenge then that Peter is giving then to the leaders, and especially in the midst of the persecution, he says in verse two, he says, be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care. That is under your care. And that verse two, it says under your care, it's that feeding that flock of God uh, feed means to, to shepherd or care for the sheep. And so that's that first uh, blank there in your, your outline. Feed the flock of God. And so shepherds had many tasks to perform, right? Uh, they would go before the sheep to see where the pasture would be, right? So that they could move and, and enjoy a, a place of, of feeding. They would make sure they had adequate water. And so uh, being a shepherd would require going ahead, right? Looking for the, for the danger that they might face, uh, surveying the land. And so how does, uh, in, the, in terms of scripture and of God's economy now, the local church, how does the shepherd, the elder, the leader in the church feed sheep? And, and again, sheep is that picture of the body of Christ, right? We make sure we don't miss that. And notice in verse one, he says to the elders among you, right? Among you, even back in chapter one, and if you want to turn back there with me just for a moment, because I think it's important that we recognize as Peter is writing this, uh, he says uh, all the way back in chapter 1, looking at verse 4, talking about being among them and having this hope. Uh, I want to make sure that the proper term is there. Um, he has given us, verse 3, I'm sorry, praise be to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ in great mercy has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that will never perish or spoil. And this is kept in heaven for you. Uh, and that faith, verse 5, he says, through faith to shield you by God's power until that coming of salvation is ready to be revealed. And so, uh, all throughout is that language of being together. And it's not quite the, the verse I was thinking of, but again, it's being among you and among the flock. And I appreciate that because Peter, as he's talking about leaders, it's not ones who are going ahead and never coming back, but is one who is among the flock of God. And so how does a, a spiritual leader in the context of the church feed the sheep today? And it's through the very thing we're doing now, right? Studying the word of God understanding that spiritual food comes from the Word, right? So if we want to know how to live and, and how to be faithful in today's world as a follower of Christ, it's to know the truth of His Word. And so a shepherd does that. He pays personal attention uh, to the sheep. And sometimes, in a needed way, that's one-on-one. -on -one. So sometimes it's corporately in a large group like this. Sometimes it's one-on-one. -on -one. And Peter had to, no doubt uh, experienced this. And Jesus gives us that, this, uh, that example. You know, John 3, Nicodemus. Jesus 
uh, shares one-on-one, right? If you remember that. In John 4, Jesus meets a, that Samaritan woman at the well, and it's a, a one-on-one context. So it's a feeding that's together with others, but then there's also some of those times where it's needed one-on-one, where that, there's that special care. And then notice in verse 2 then, back in chapter 5, he continues, he says, be shepherds of God's flock that are under your care. And then he says, watching over them, watching over them. And so the shepherd is to watch over the flock. And that word uh, overseer, shepherd that's used, or, or bishop means overseer, one who looks over for the purpose of leading. And so notice, uh, again, the shepherd is both among and over. And so the shepherd can't forget that he's among the sheep too. And it's important as we think about the shepherd, those who lead in the context of the church, to recognize that they're among the sheep, right? There's nothing worse than uh, being in a position of leadership as pastor where people sometimes put them on a pedestal, right? And we can't do that. The scripture is clear that, that there's a gift of teaching and leading, but it's not so to be on a pedestal, but to be among and to teach, to watch over the flock, to care for the flock. And it's true that the authority of the pastor in the context of the local church comes from the Word of God. It starts and stops at the very Word of God. And it's important for us to know that. If you're part of a church uh, that doesn't promote and, and talk about the Word of God, then run, right? That, that's a big deal. We need to confront and make sure. And uh, we work hard as a, as a church family here to say, if God's Word says it, we're going to do it. We're going to teach it because it's what the Word talks about. And so the shepherd is watching over the flock. He's, he's pointing the sheep continually to God in his word, right? Saying, this is what the Lord says. That's that watching over, uh, making sure that helping them to learn and to grow together. And sometimes it's having those difficult situations, those difficult conversations too, right? Some of you who have been parents or grandparents or mentors, you understand this challenge, right? There are times that those that we're watching over or giving care to, or even in the business world, right, we have to have those conversations to say, hey, this is what's best. In the business world, it's because, hey, we have this manual we need to follow. We have these rules that we're walking by. In God's economy, in the local church, it's, hey, this is the truth of God's word. And so as we're among the flock, as we're with one another, there's times where the shepherd or those that lead will come alongside and say, here's what God's word says. And they point out the dangers, you know, like the shepherd will do as he goes ahead to look for that place to feed in a pasture. He looks for those dangers and then is able to encourage or help protect or to guide the sheep. And so then notice the, the negative then that Peter says, uh, and when he talks about shepherding the flock and watching over them, he goes on to, to, to state some negative imperatives. He says, not because you must, but because you're willing, as God wants you to be, to be. Not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve. Not lording it over those who are entrusted to you, but being an example to the flock. And so the, the third thing, or so the negatives then, just for a moment, let's, let's note those. Not because you must, but because you are willing. In other words, as a, as a shepherd leads the flock, it's because his love for God spills over into his love for people. It's not a job. It's not something that it's, it's a have to. You know, we say around here, it's a get to. You know, it's a privilege to, to lead. And so it's not like, well, if there's no other way, right? It's not out of fear either or compulsion, but again, uh, that desire that God brings. Elsewhere in scripture, when it talks about this bishop, this teacher, this position of pastor, it says, uh, he who desires the office of a bishop desires a good thing. You know, it's a desire that God places. So it's not a, well, I have to do this, but because of a willingness, a love for God and his people. And it's not pursuing, then, Peter goes on, he says, not pursuing dishonest gain. In other words, using what God provides so that his best hours or the best time of day is used to, to plan and prepare and to lead God's people to follow that chief shepherd. You know, Titus 1, 7 says, since an overseer, Titus 1, 7 says, since an overseer manages God's household, he must be blameless, not overbearing, not quick-tempered, not given to drunkenness, not violent, not pursuing dishonest gain. And so it's a matter of guarding that heart and to recognize, hey, this isn't for 
you know, filthy lucre where I can get rich. No, I'm going to love God and, and trust that he'll provide so I can care for and shepherd the flock. And I don't know too many, right, besides those that we see on TV, and granted, God only knows the heart, right, that, that step into pastoral ministry because that's the desire, right, of that dishonest gain. But again, the warning is given. It's not for that dishonest gain, but rather for the glory of God. And then he goes on to, to state then the positive. He says, eager to serve. And you notice uh, not lording it over not dishonest gain. I'm sorry, right after dishonest gain in verse two, he says, but eager to serve, eager to serve. And the word eager is the same word that Paul uses uh, in Romans 1.17. So if you want to jot down Romans 1.17, Peter, uh, Paul is talking about his eagerness to preach the word. Imagine it like this. Here's, here's a great example to help you understand. So uh, when you get something new, when you're, especially when we're young, uh, think about the Christmas season, right? It's right around the corner. And you get something new. Are you excited to tell others about it? Yeah. I mean, kids are, right? You know, like, you can't wait to say, hey, this, this new shiny thing I got, you know, is awesome. Maybe as adults now, it's like, oh, this, this new job I got or, or this new car or this new thing, right? Washing machine or sewing machine or, you know, whatever it is that we love. You know, maybe it's that awesome shovel that you get to use in the yard now. You know, that's some of the fun adult things that, that we get, right? Right. Uh, but uh, we're excited. There, that's the idea of being eager. Like, I can't wait to share this. It's a eager to, to preach the word that Paul uses in Romans 1.17. It's a desire of the heart. So it's, it's not a job. It's a desire of the heart. And it's sometimes what we do as parents, right? Or when we work with others in the job place. We try to make it something to be enjoyable and not a job. It's a, a desire. But only God can produce that. And so Peter is saying, then it's uh, an eagerness to serve. I remember in Bible college, uh, our homiletics professor uh, stating, he, he said this about us preacher boys. He said, listen, if there's anything else that you can do or you have a desire to do, he said, go do it. It's like, why would he say that? Well, because it's, it, it's a call that God gives us, right? And it's a desire that God gives us. And it's not there. He said, go pursue something else. Even as the scripture says, he who desires the office of a bishop desires a good thing. That's what uh, Titus tells us. And so that eagerness is there of the shepherd, out of that desire of the heart that God gives to, again, eager to serve, not himself, but again, the flock, right? To feed them, to be that example, like verse 3 as he goes on to say then. Uh, so third one there is to be an example of the flock. Look then with me. At verse 3, he says, Not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being an example to the flock. You can drive sheep, or I'm sorry, you can't drive sheep, but you can go before them and lead them. And I don't know much about the animals in terms of uh, firsthand experience, but everything we read about them, they can't be driven. They have to be led. And I, I didn't really get permission to share this, but I, I so appreciate our lead pastor, because he exemplifies us as an example to the flock. You know, one of the things that he's done leading our church is serving the church for many years before feeling God's call to lead the church. And he still does that. It's not uncommon to come in on a Sunday morning and see Pastor Aaron do all these things to get church ready, you know, whether it's washing a window or, you know, fixing a TV. Some of us aren't as OCD, so we don't notice those things. Uh, and I don't share those to lift him up, but to lift God up. God has produced this in our pastor and a spirit of serving to be that example, to lead. And it, it stirs my heart. Like, I want to serve the Lord better because I see him do that. And, uh, and it's not just Aaron. I see it in, in uh, uh, Pastor Ryan as well and in our, in our staff too. That becomes a fabric of who we are as followers of Christ because our lead shepherd does that. And, uh, and it's an awesome thing. But again, it's a result of a shepherd who is serving the flock results in the fact that Christ is pleased. And so you might be thinking, well, I'm not a shepherd, but remember, this is all who lead. We can learn something from this, right? At some point in our lives, God is going to allow us, if he's willing, to, to lead others. And so we want to serve. And, and notice he says, not lording it over them in verse 3. So it's not like, hey, look at me or do this because I said so. The shepherd leads by example. He's an example to the flock to, to bring them along. And then he continues on then in verse 4. 
Uh, and I love what Peter says, continuing in verse 4. He says, when the good shepherd, and when the good, or, and I'm sorry, and when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. See, the reward is received uh, by the Lord himself, from the Lord himself in glory when you go to be with him, right? So remember, these believers, what are they going through? They're going through suffering, right? They're facing some hard times. And so how is um, this encouraging? It's because, hey, when you are an example, when you are serving, when you're being that example of serving Christ and of serving others, it pleases that chief shepherd. And what's the reward? He will give it to us. And what does it look like? Scripture talks about rewards in different ways, about what those crowns are going to be. And I want to get all distracted with that, other than the, the simple truth of this, that in the face of persecution, Peter's encouraging the leaders in the church to continue to serve, even though there's such great persecution, because the focus is on the chief shepherd, the one who's going to reward, right? And again, that, that reward is something that won't fade away. And how amazing is it? for us as believers who know Christ as Lord and Savior to look forward to that day when we're with Christ, right? The one who's made us. We get to be with him face to face, right? No more suffering, no more pain, no more sorrow, right? No frustration, no worry, no fear. We're with the Savior face to face, which is, is going to be amazing. And so now Peter focuses then the attention on all believers. And notice in verse 5, it begins with the phrase, in the same way. Verse 5, he continues on. In the same way, you who are younger, submit yourselves to your elders. All of you, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another, because God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. How believers should respond when facing trials. That first one, then, is to, to be humble. Remember back in, in week 4, when... Uh, we had already heard that challenge to submit to governing authorities. In 1 Peter 2, 13, uh, Brother John said it well, to submit for the Lord's sake, right, for the sake of others and, and for your sake. And now Peter has commended all the believers to submit then to God and to others. The younger believers should submit, submit to the older believers, not only out of, like, respect because of their age. Uh, it's not simply just that but also the respect for that spiritual maturity, right? Those who are walking with the Lord and are pointing others to Christ. Those are who we want to submit to. And he begins by this verse by saying, clothe yourself with humility. And I love this picture. And scripture is full of them, right? Clothing yourself with humility. I think of uh, the New Testament when it talks about clothing ourselves with righteousness, right? So we don't receive and we don't accomplish perfection on our own. All of us know that, right? We've, we fall short. But what God offers to us through his grace is that forgiveness and that righteousness that comes through the finished work of the cross. And so as we clothe ourselves with righteousness, we can be clothed then in humility because we're humbling ourselves to God. And he's saying being clothed is that picture of what Christ does for us. Think of Philippians 2, and you can jot it down. We won't take the time uh, to read all of the verses, uh, but I would love for us to turn there. Philippians 2, and just looking at verses 1, uh, a, a couple of verses we'll look at together, is this picture of what true humility looks like. Philippians 2, because Christ gives us that ultimate example of what it's like to be clothed in humility. It's the, the Son of God coming here, to take on the form of man. In Philippians 2, verse 5, he, he says this, um, In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking on the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in the appearance of a man, humbled himself, by the obedience to death, even the death on a cross. So Christ gives us that example of taking on the form of man, of humbling himself to be that servant, right? And as we see in Scripture, to, to be that sheep led to the slaughter, right? Knowing that he came here on a mission, right? That greatest rescue mission, to come here, to go to that cross for you and I, to, to save us from our sin, to bring that forgiveness. And so we have to first humble ourselves before God, 
or we can never be submissive toward one another. Don't miss that. We first have to humble ourselves before God before we can be submissive before others or humble ourselves before others. And it begins, first of all, with that relationship of calling on Jesus as Lord and Savior. Where we humble ourselves. We see ourselves as God sees us as sinful and in need of a Savior, in need of a Savior and that forgiveness. And so Christ is that example. He's the one that provides for us to have the opportunity of humility is because he went to the cross for us. He went to the cross for us. So we have to humble, to first humble ourselves before God, or we could never be submissive toward one another. And so the first one is, is be humble. And again, I appreciate what Warren Wearsby says. He's a, an old preacher, I think from Western Ohio, actually, or Eastern Ohio, actually, not too far away growing up. He said, humility is not demeaning ourselves and thinking poorly of ourselves. It's simply not thinking of ourselves at all. I love that. He says, not thinking of ourselves at all. So it's not demeaning or, or thinking more poorly, but really less or not at all of ourselves and thinking about others. And so looking back then at our text in 1 Peter 5, uh, Peter quotes there, and I'm not sure if your scripture does it. I love how uh, my portion of the NIV does it. It puts in parentheses, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. And he's quoting Proverbs 3.34, which says, Proverbs 3.34 says he mocks proud mockers, but shows favor to the humble and the oppressed. It's the same scripture that uh, James 4.6, it says, but he gives us more grace. That's why the scripture says God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. So why does God oppose the proud? Why does God oppose the proud? Proverbs 16, or Proverbs 6, 16. You might jot this down. Proverbs 6, 16, and 17. And it says this. It'd be worth a flip there if you want to turn to Proverbs 6, 16, and 17. This is how we know God opposes the proud. It simply says this. Proverbs 6, 16, and 17 is laid out. Six things that God hates. And one of those in there is described this idea of being proud, this truth of, of being proud. It says, there are six things the Lord hates, seven that are detestable to him. Verse 17 says, haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that deceives, wicked schemes, and feet that are quick to rush into evil, a false witness who pours out lies, and a person who stirs up conflict in the community. And so... I say 16 and 17, I, or actually, I'm sorry, I read through verse 19 there. But the first one on that list is the haughty eyes in verse 17. That's the pride of looking down on others. That's the pride of looking down on others. It's a thinking of ourselves more highly than we ought to think. And so this is, as Scripture describes, is something that God would oppose. And why? Because he's that picture of humility, right? Jesus didn't come on the scene and say, hey, it's all about me. No, he laid himself down. It was all about the glory of the Father. And so it's a challenge to be humble, isn't it? Like we can get into that moment where we think, hey, things are going pretty well. And, and pretty soon somebody's like, hey, man, I really appreciate the way you did that and uh, how you responded in that situation. And we're like, yeah, I am pretty good. And, and we forget, no, it's only because of God's grace, right? That, that I'm in this position that I was able to respond that way. And let me tell you about my Jesus, right? And, and share with them the change that he's made in us. And uh, I had a conversation just last week with uh, another Christian, and, and the tone of their conversation about another family member was just so disheartening because it was that of pride, right? It was a, a looking down upon. And we have to be careful, with, especially within the church, right? As, as Christ begins to change us and to transform our lives and we begin to live for Christ, others start to see that. And, and we, we, we know we're a peculiar people, as we've been learning about in 1 Peter here, as followers of Christ. And sometimes we can think more highly of ourselves than we ought to think, rather than recognize, you know what, if it weren't for God's grace, we would be in that same place as someone who has a drug addiction, right? Or has a, a challenge in their marriage that they're having a hard time overcoming or whatever it is, fill in the blank. So we have to guard against that. And it's easy to feel like we're better than others, isn't it? It's easy to, to think, well, yeah, I mean, I, I am better than others. But the truth is, no. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it, right? It's one of those verses that God has put in my heart and mind to remind me to, to be humble. So humility is the, the submission that shows our faith in God. 
that he knows what's best and he knows what is best in our lives and we're trusting in him to, to direct our lives. And so then he continues on then into verse 6 when he says, humble yourselves then. Verse 6, humble yourselves then, yourselves therefore under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. He may lift you up in due time. And so verse 6 makes it clear then if we're humbling ourselves, we're then going to look to him. We're going to trust God in his mighty hand. We're going to trust him to lead us. We're going to trust him to provide what is needed. And that's why verse 7 then gives us that, that command, that imperative. He says, in, and so the second point in our outline then under this section is to, to cast your care on him. And so notice verse 7. He says, cast all your anxiety on him because he, what, cares for you. Man, if there's not a verse in Scripture that you haven't memorized yet, here is one, right? One that's such a good reminder to us. Cast your care upon him. Why? Because he cares for you. Do you believe that tonight? Do you believe that today as you're, you're hearing this truth that God cares for you? I think some of us have grown up in homes where we haven't understood what it was like for someone to really care. But God knows your heart, right? And he loved you enough. Like the scripture says, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He made a way for you to have a relationship with the Heavenly Father. He made a way for us to have a relationship with the Father. That's how much he cares. Peter knew firsthand how much God cared. Think about some of his experiences. In Luke 5, uh, he gives Peter this great catch of fish, right? Hey, cast your nets here, and they got more than they can handle. Uh, he helped Peter to, to walk on water, right? How awesome is that, Right? come out on the water, and Peter comes out, and has he, has he has eyes on Christ. Now, it didn't work out so well there for a minute, but when he took his eyes off, but again, he saw how much he cared. Uh, think with me about Luke 22, where, uh, where he, uh, Jesus repaired uh, Melchus, his ear, right? After, I mean, Peter was right there. It's like, hey, who's the one that took the sword out, right? Lopped his ear off, and you see the care of Jesus there. Uh, he, deliv he delivered Peter from prison in Acts 12. And so he's experienced that care firsthand. Psalm 55, 22 says this. It says, cast your cares on the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never let the righteous be shaken. Don't miss that. So he, here, it, casting our cares on him is not, well, maybe just the big ones. No, it's all cares. We can do that. It's, a, it's the idea of rolling them off onto, onto the Father, saying, Lord, would you take these cares? I don't know about you, but I need that reminder often, right? To cast our care upon him, for he cares for us. And I appreciate the psalmist. Again, psalms just help us think and feel with God. And the psalmist says it too. Cast your care on the Lord and, and he'll sustain you. He'll sustain you. So, so cast your care on him. And then thirdly, be watchful. Let's look at verses 8 and 9. 8 and 9. He says, Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Verse 9, resist him. Stand firm in the faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of suffering. And so he says, be watchful, this idea of staying alert. I love how one translation says uh, to be sober-minded means to have our minds under control when it comes to conflict with Satan. And have you been around those folks who in time of conflict, that they have a sober mind, they have a ready mind, right? They're, they're not swayed by emotion or others' opinions around them. They're, they're steadied. And so how do we stay alert? I mean, think back to, to Genesis, how the, the serpent was so crafty with Eve, right? And you will not surely die, he said, right? So sly of, of sliding in that lie. And remember what Ephesians 6.12, I put it in the notes for us because it's so important. Paul says this, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. And so Paul is saying again in another writing to, to be renewed in the spirit of our mind because the fight isn't physical. Oftentimes there's that spiritual, right? So having our minds being sober because the evil one is prowling around. He's looking who we might devour. 
And Peter's description as God moved him to write, it's like a, like a prowling lion, you know? So he's sitting there waiting to just attack, looking for that opportune moment. And I think it's often because of our fallen nature, because of our sinfulness and wanting to do things on our own, we, we kind of walk our own route and, and we get lax in terms of our preparing our mind. Do you know your mind is a muscle that it can be exercised? And so, uh, so often some say, well, I just can't memorize, Pastor. And, and I say, no, you can. God can help us. I mean, think of how many song lyrics, right? You hear a song. And I, I once took uh, one of these passages from First Peter to Gilligan's Island when I was trying to memorize it for a test. So, so First Peter five, uh, as, is it in First Peter? And this is the record that God has given to us: eternal life in this life is in His Son. So I put it to Gilligan's Island to memorize it. My point is this: if we exercise it, we can memorize it, we can use it, and we can grow that muscle. And so, I mean, just going to the gym, right? You work out. Like going for a run is to exercise those muscles, to exercise the heart so it's prepared and it's healthy. It's the same for us. We have to guard our hearts against being deceived. It's why Proverbs 4.23 says, keep the heart with all diligence. Proverbs 4.23, mark it down. Keep the heart with all diligence, for out of it flows the issues of life. And so how do we keep our heart? How do we stay alert, have that ready mind is by going to the scripture. It's by going to the word of God. It's to not only memorizing, but spending time in the word. I find in my own personal life, when I'm failing at loving Sarah like I should my wife or caring for my children like I should or caring for my responsibilities as a shepherd, often results because I'm not putting Christ at the center. I'm not spending time in the word and with him and being yielded and humbling myself first to God. And I can get prideful and, and think and arrogant and think I'm better. And so we have to guard against that. Psalm 119, verse 105. Psalm 119, verse 105. It says, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And so God will use his word as we spend time with him individually on our own in the word. Because the truth is, our how many hours uh, a year spending time on a Sunday morning or Saturday night at church is not enough. We have to be spending that time on our own of, of learning and, and like times like these as well to go deeper into the word. Back in 2007, uh, my daughter Sophia was born on Palm Sunday, happened to be April 1st, but it was Palm Sunday in 2007. And uh, I was excitedly uh, heading to church that Easter. It's the first Sunday after my daughter was born. And I was all excited, like proud father, like first time dad. And, and I'm pulling into a parking spot. And this one side of the church had a, um, had a railing that jetted out into the parking spaces. It was kind of close, you know, it was an older church. And so I'm backing into the position where I'm going to park in the street. So that way I can just drive out after church, you know, to get to lunch and all that. But anyway, uh, as I'm backing in, all of a sudden there's a bam. And, you know, I'm like, no, that did not just happen. You know, I turn around, look, I hit the pole, you know, the, for the, the railing, for the stairs to go up in the church. I'm thinking, I cannot believe I just did that. And I'm driving my Buick, and it's like the nicest of our two cars at the time. And it was, you know, I think six years old at the point, but I, I hadn't put full coverage on it. Uh, well, it's, I'm sorry, I had put full coverage, but it was a $1,000 deductible. And I'm thinking, man, that's a lot of money. You know, we just had the baby and thinking of all these expenses. So here's how easy our mind is. This is how easy the Satan is, is ready to devour, right? So, hey, Randy, just change the deductible to 500 because you could do that online back then. And then you could just call it in a couple days later and claim it. You know, that's only $500. So I'm, I'm thinking all this through my mind. You know, at church happens and we all go like, you know, going to church like, oh, that's not my thoughts, right? We put on that good front. And anyway, I'm thankful to report that God convicted my heart. And I didn't do that. And I realized, man, Lord is not going to honor this. But Peter is saying that, hey, we have to be alert, right? It lurks in there so quickly. It's like, you're a pastor. You were going to lie about insurance? Yeah, because remember, among the flock, right? Just like others, another sheep, right? It's trying to, to follow the great shepherd, and so we have to guard our hearts. And, and God blessed, you know, it was like $250, found one in a junkyard. And another friend painted it for 50 bucks. So it was like cheaper than even if we would have claimed it on insurance. God bless, and I, I thank him for that. And so we have to, to be watchful, to, to be on guard. And so Peter's saying that we're not alone in this suffering. He was telling them, the, the believers there, and their suffering that they face with the evil one. 
And he continues on then. Uh, so, so notice, I do want to just note in verse 9 before we continue on. He says, because you know the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of suffering. He's encouraging them to let them know, like, hey, you're not alone in this. And I appreciate all the pictures of the flock is that it's more than just one sheep. God has given us others. And to know that even as they're going through that suffering, that they weren't alone. And most importantly then, he goes on to, to speak about the one who that they could look to. In verse 10, he continues on. He says, in the God of all grace, and don't you love it? That's the word we've seen time and time again through First Peter. The, the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. And so number four is to, to be hopeful, to be hopeful. And we have God's grace, he says here. Our, our salvation is because of God's grace. And in 1 Peter 1.10, he has called us before we are we, we called on him. And so as we submit to him, he gives us the grace that we need. It's always about the grace, God's unmerited favor toward us. In fact, he is the God of all grace, as Peter says here. The God of all grace. He's the one. And then verse 11, to him be the power forever and ever. Amen. And so as a believer, we know we're going to glory, right? We have that hope of glory. We, we learned that back in chapter 1 and verse 4. And into an inheritance that can never perish. That was the description of chapter 1 and verse 4. That will never perish, spoil, or fade. And this inheritance is kept in heaven for you. And so the suffering may be difficult. The trials we face will be hard. But ultimately, no matter what happens here, there's a hope of glory. Right? There's a hope of that eternity, of being with the Savior. And it'll lead to glory. And that is really all that counts, right? The suffering is only for a little while. In chapter 1, verse 6, he says it's a, a season that God is building character. And he goes on uh, in three words to describe uh, in the last part of this section then uh, of, uh, of verse 10. Uh, three words to describe to describe this season of building character. He says established in verse 10. He says established. Uh, resolved to make you strong, firm, and stand fast. Steadfast, rather. And so established. Another translation says fix firmly or to set fast. And so our hearts need to be established. And this is accomplished by God's truth. So a believer who is established, and this is accomplished again, by God's word. And if we're established in God's word, if we're committed to it, if we know that truth, we're going to be able to stand strong when persecution comes. We'll be able to, to stand firm, to stand that ground. And this is important for a leader. It's important for all the sheep, right, to stand firm when the suffering is going to come. It's going to be there, right? It's going to show up. We learned about that last week. And so we can be established in the word so we're ready to go against it. Otherwise, the believer who, is a, who isn't established is going to be moved by false doctrine. And in 1 Peter 3.17, we talked about being firm because of the truth. And then he says, secondly, strength. God's strength is given to us to meet the demands of this life. The strength he's given us to meet the demands of this life. What good is it to stand on a firm foundation if we don't have the power to act, right? And so that strength, that that power, ability to stand against it, isn't in our own strength, right? Paul would say it in this way, his strength is made perfect in our weakness, right? Because we're resting in Christ to work in us and through us. And then thirdly, he says firm, to, to lay a foundation that the word is used here is, is firm. And it's the same word that's used in Matthew 7, talking about how a house that is built upon the rock you remember that? It'll, it'll stand against the storm, even though it comes and those waves bash over it, it's not going to fall down. And so when an unbeliever faces a storm, they're tossed to and fro. But as a follower of Christ, if we're standing firm in the word and we have the, the spirit of God to help us, we won't be shaken. We won't be shaken. And then he continues on then with an interesting uh, benediction. So verse 11, again, is that power, again, not in our own strength, but, but through God. And then he gives that final greeting. 
He says, with the help of Silas, whom I regarded as a faithful brother, I have written to you briefly, encouraging you and testifying that this is the true, there it is again, grace of God. So stand fast in it. Stand fast in it. So she who is in Babylon, so who's the she that he's referring to? Some have said, well, potentially could be someone that he was married to. Uh, others have said, well, Babylon is pointing to, to the temple. And so uh, in the New Testament age, is it the church? I think it's more the church, those that have been chosen together. When we come back and look at chapter one uh, to the believers uh, that he's writing to. But regardless of who you say that is, we know the, the benediction is given with love because he says in verse 14, greet one another with what? A kiss of love. Now, we get weirded out by that because our culture, you know, kissing is between a man and woman. You know, we don't often think of that as brothers and sisters in Christ as something to do. But again, it was part of their culture to greet one another. How did they do it? Was it on the hand? Was it on the cheek? You know, there's some history you can read about that. But don't miss this. The, the heart of what Peter is, is uh, giving us in this benediction is that it is out of love. It's rooted in that love. And it points to love that's expressed with a kiss. You know? So we might say, hey, give a holy handshake right now in our culture today. Uh, or that, that handshake out of love. Uh, or maybe a, a hug of embrace, right, in our culture. And how needed is that, right, when we're facing persecution to remind brothers and sisters in Christ of who Christ is, that we can stand firm in him, that we can be hopeful. Because, again, our hope is not here, right? It's not in what we can accumulate, right? Our culture says that what he who has the most toys, you know, wins. And it's none of that. We realize in God's economy, it's how do we please the Father? How do we honor him? How do we use the resources he's given us to please him? And so it's the, the spirit that Peter is calling this is a, out of love, and it points to express it. And love is all throughout. I mean, chapter 1, 22, he talks about that. Chapter 2, verse 17. Uh, chapter 4, verse 8, and then 12. And so it's all throughout. And so now here, he says, greet one another with that, that kiss of love. And so leave that true grace of God creates a family, right? The true grace of God creates a family. We become a flock that's following the good shepherd, which is the, our heavenly father at utmost. And so Christianity is a divine family. It's created by the grace of God. And these people are, are suffering and it creates a situation where they need one another. And friends, that's the same within the church today, right? People are hurting. When they come through the doors at Grace Chapel, when they come through the, the doors of your home, do they experience that kind of love, that they would be embraced, that would be pointed to the grace of God, right? That has brought us into relationship, and then we can be in relationship with one another to encourage. And then we're going to have peace, as he says, peace to all of you who are in Christ. That's the one that we have to point to, the one that we want to point others to, to encourage one another to be mindful of, that that's where that peace is going to come from, ultimately in Christ. And so whether you're a leader or not, God wants to use all of us, whether we're a shepherd of a church or we're shepherding in our home or in the workplace, that we can be used of him and to minister to one another within God's economy and his flock. It's an awesome thing, isn't it, to be able to share. And let's pray together. Father, we thank you. Thank you for you being the God of all grace, uh, the one who has brought us into relationship through your son. Father, we didn't deserve forgiveness. We know when we look at our own hearts, uh, Father, it, it's scary to us, and yet we know, Father, you see our heart and you love us the same. And Father, thank you for this epistle and just the truth that it brings to our lives to remind us to, to cast our care upon you, to be watchful, Father, for the, the evil one who's lurking, that we would guard our hearts, that we'd be ready to do battle, to stand firm in your word, because persecution is going to come. There could be a day even in our own country here that we would face persecution because of our belief in Christ. We're not promised that. So help us to be ready, to continue to ready our minds to, to stand firm. And we maybe even face it in the workplace because of our love for you. And so, Lord, help us to, to stand firm in your truth and to guard our minds and our hearts with it. And then, Father, help us to love one another, to encourage others to do that, whether it be in group life here at Grace Chapel or, uh, Father, just encouraging uh, one another in our weekly times as we gather around the Word on Sunday mornings or Saturday nights. Uh, 
I pray you'd help us to be faithful, uh, to encourage one another as sheep who are following you, the, the great shepherd. And so, Lord, thank you for leading us. We thank you for the, the examples that you give us, not only in your word, but among your body of believers that follow you and humble themselves to follow you. And uh, may we continue to encourage one another. May you find us faithful. And we thank you that ultimately, if we never experience relief from suffering here, we'll get to be with you for eternity where there won't be suffering and there won't be that sadness. There'll be, uh, Lord, a great time of worship of you. And so we thank you for the truth of your word. Thank you for this time we've had to learn together. May you direct now in our time as we discuss in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord.